Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Reeperbahn Festival Conference 2021 at home and here in the Schmidtchen. It's great to have you all with us today. And I am very honored to be sitting here to talk about how the climate crisis will hit the music industry, because in June I was allowed to do the first panel on this topic, and then it was called How the Climate Crisis Will Hit the Music Industry. We have changed the name now. It is now How the Climate Crisis Hits the Music Industry. So in the last four months, we all have realized it's already here. We don't have to wait for it to come. The climate crisis is with us and we are working out ways to find out how to fix it. In June, I had wonderful guests sitting on stage with me or talking to me remotely. Um, Helen um, Smith is chair from Impala. She was with me and Tanner Watt from Reverb. Uh, Jakob Billabel, who knows everything about sustainability and events, uh, was with me on stage. And Horst Weidenmüller was not with me on stage, but he's here with me today too. And you are obviously very important in this process because you were part of the climate charter for Impala. You are the chair as well, or the board on the board uh, for Impala. And you are known as the founder of K7 Music, which is something you've been doing for many years. You're, you've been in the music industry for such a long time. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. And thank you, Katrin Vipa, for being here today. Um, you are co-founder of The Change Agency, a new agency that was just uh, brought into life uh, to talk about events um, and making them good for the for the environment and making them sustainable. And um, you also are a part of Music Declares Emergency, which is uh, something you can tell us about in a minute. But thank you for being here with us today. Uh, Chiara Badiali is Knowledge and Sector Intelligence Lead, Julie's Bicycle, United Kingdom. And what they do, she's going to tell us um, as well. But thank you so much for joining us all the way from the UK today. That's great to have you with us. And we have Nicolas Ninas, member of the European Parliament, the Greens, Germany. He's a very, very busy obviously, because we are standing a couple days before the election, so you're busy, but it's, uh, I'm glad you found some time to speak with us today about this such important topic. So, Horst, I'm going to start with you and ask you, what do you think has changed in the last four months? Have we gotten any further, or are we still standing where we were back then? No, I think what has changed is awareness and the need to change. And I think it's, it's a given that the change is the reality and no more optional. And that is what we feel in the engagement from Impala. We from Impala, we have 5,000 plus something members across Europe. So for us, it was always the plan to develop a program like a train, which starts and whenever ever anybody feels comfortable or right to enter into the environmental topic to come into the train and the programs and the recommendations are there. And we are seeing now that more and more members are coming and saying it becomes a priority. And I think, I think the cultural sector, the musical sector was always very sensitive and I think we see all the change and we all see the need to change our behavior. Absolutely. And uh, Katrin, um, obviously you started a new agency because you also realized that something has to be done. So maybe you can tell us a little about your role as the co-founder of the Change Agency and as your work for Music Declares Emergency. Right. So Music Declares Emergency is a network of artists and uh, music professionals. And we demand immediate government action because we see the fact that life on this planet is in danger because of the dev natural devastation and the destruction of ecosystems. And um, we think that the music industry has a unique role through its cultural and economic stance by shifting towards a carbon neutral society. So that's Music Declares Emergency. And then the Change Agency, we found it because we want to really be a part of the shift and really make sure to take action and to take action now because there's no more time. Yeah, there absolutely is no more time. Um, and uh, Chiara, you also with Julie's Bike Bicycle have an organization that is uh, specialized in this. You also had to do, or you were helping with the climate charter for Impala. So first of all, uh, let us know what Julie's Bike Bicycle is for those who don't know what this agency is or this organization. Yeah, so Julie's Bicycle is an NGO and charity and we were originally founded um, nearly 15 years ago so it's um, funny to feel like we're running out of time because I think we felt like we were running out of time 15 years ago. Uh, we were founded from within the UK music industry to really help uh, work with the industry and mobilise climate and environmental action and sort of provide that one-stop shop and make sure that everyone knew what action to take. Um, so we, we work with people and skills and giving everyone the tools and resources they need. And crucially then also looking at cultural policy so that again, we, we identify those levers of change so that it's not just individual people taking action. Um, and through that work, we support and have co-founded lots of networks, bringing people together, 
whether that is music declares emergency, or it's the Vision 2025 um, network that works with festivals here in the UK, or whether it's supporting organisations like Impala to, to support their membership. And Nicholas, obviously, as member of the Green Party here in Germany um, and working for the European Parliament, uh, you also do t talk about other topics um, regarding the, the, the topic of sustainability. But regarding the music industry, where would you see your insight on that? Yes, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. And um, I think the major point when we talk about sustainability, um, and in that case also with the SDGs, is that it's not just a question that is just solely uh, there for, for example, the energy industry or uh, just partially groups of um, the society, but really a, um, a question that affects everyone and therefore also, of course, the cultural um, sector as a whole and that including the, the musical people. And for that, I think it's uh, very fair to say that we have uh, taken several steps to think about what does it actually mean when we talk about culture and sustainability and how can we improve and help to improve um, that culture can talk about um, uh, um, sustainability but also is more and more sustainable in the future. Um, we're, we're, uh, the if we look at everything that we can talk about, I think when we talk about sustainability and, and living our lives in a sustainable way, even regarding music, um, it has also to do with having to wave things in our lives, but it actually doesn't. If we think of it in a positive way, I think we can get people to to adhere more to, to changing stuff um, regarding the fact of, of sustainability. Horace, would you agree on that? And how do we get people to be more positive about the whole change. I mean, I, I would like to give quite an, an example of the recorded music industry. I mean, um, everybody, or it's, it's seen as a very complex process to green the recorded music industry. And we in Impala has looked about the key things which needs to happen in order to change. And what we see, for instance, as a very easy win is, is electricity. You know, when we switched, when we switched from K7 to green energy, we saved about 60% of our carbon footprint. If we get uh, the pressing plants to do the same, we have another 60% reduced. And if we get the DSPs to do the same, we have in the entire value chain, by just one change, 60% of the annual carbon footprint extracted or not even inserted. And these are really easy wins we can all achieve. And this is also the conversations Impala have with manufacturing companies, with the DSPs, what their plan is, because everybody recognizes it's the road they have to go or they want to go. The question is, when do they go it? How fast do they go it? What is their plan? And that is where we're building partnerships. But it's, it's, it sounds complex. It is complex, but they're also very easy, recognizable wins we can do. And we even know from our home the impact of just switching to green energy. It's no longer more expensive and it has a huge impact. And it's a little example of what can be done. Actually, uh, Chiara, uh, Julie's Bicycle and Arts Council Ingle, England released the Culture, Climate and Environmental Responsibility Annual Report. And in that, it says that um, environmentally responsible companies um, it have significant value uh, increases. So it's actually something really good, right? <coughs> yeah, I mean, I think the scale of the transformation that we need to achieve to sort of hit the climate crisis head on is so deep that we have to fundamentally rewire the way that we think and everything that we do. Um, and, and the way that we're going to get there is through action, not just thinking. It's sort of every time you do something, there's, there's something in your brain that starts shifting a little bit. And so I think from our work with Arts Council England, it started off as a, a very simple intervention. It was asking all the organisations that got regular funding to report their annual carbon footprint and to put in place an environmental policy and action plan. Um, and that was a very simple intervention, but it, it opened up that door for people to build their understanding and start taking those steps. And what we found is, is it prompted this huge richness of all the things that climate action can intersect with. So people were shaping new partnerships with their communities, with their local authorities. They were creating new types of programming. Um, one thing that most people reported is that actually their teams and their staff were super, super happy um, about the action being taken because everyone wants to feel like they're working uh, or taking action on the climate crisis. I think 
uh, that that kind of action can really help with anxiety. So, and of course, it, it sort of ch shaped and changed the conversations that people were having with their audiences as well. Um, and that's sort of way beyond any financial savings from energy efficiency or anything else. It's just it really changed the way that cultural organizations sit within their communities and see themselves as part of those communities. Nicholas, do you think, though, that uh, we are in a kind of a, a positive bubble? How do you think we and you as uh, a politician can get everyone on board? Do you mean the, in the culture sector or do you mean uh, in the society? Well, both, actually. All right, I think, first of all, uh, from the society, we are already seeing a lot of change. And I think it is the question of how do we talk about this topic and the question that you raised earlier, you were talking about sustainability, we have to understand that it does not necessarily mean that it is a reduction of uh, comfort or or um, or anything like that, but that it's just a, a shift of priorities. Um, and in, instead, you know, if you're looking, for example, at, at lighting, um, if you're having the, the special lights, uh, the usual ones, the, with the old um, light bulbs, um, they're, they're getting hot, they're very expensive, they have a lot of um, energy need, but there's also money that you're wasting on it. If you're turning over to LEDs, you just save, you're also saving the environment, but you're also uh, saving a few bucks in your own. So I think it shows that we have uh, examples where we can take over and win over the society uh, for the whole project of sustainability. For the cultural sector though, I think what's very important is if we want to have the cultural sector as a whole, which is from the public side, chronically underfunded, um, if we want the cultural sector to have the, um, the, the way over to the sustainability, we cannot ask them to like to do that only um, with the current existing culture funding, because culture funding is for culture, for the support of the creativity, etc. And not so much to change uh, energy light bulbs, anything like that. But for that, we need additional funding that we use, for example, from the economic um, standpoint, but also for uh, energy efficiency uh, principles, etc. So I think if we do that and we really take on the society, no matter if it's only the cultural society or everybody, uh, then we have a chance uh, to take. Them with us and to show them what the benefits are and that they are the ones who are profiting off it in the end because in the end sustainability means exactly one thing to have the possibility to enjoy something even longer because we have additional years that we add to the to the um, bills of our way to life um, in, in the future it sounds like it's just so obvious, but I, I guess we still haven't all got there. Let's speak about the awareness of the artists. Um, music declares emergency. Obviously, the people who are a part of it already are already aware. But how do you get people, the artists, to be aware of the problem and get them to be to on board <coughs> that uh, organization? Yeah, uh, basically through dialogue, because I think the most fundamental realization you can have is that there is no music on a dead planet. That's our slogan, and that is really what this is all about, <coughs> you know, in the end. So once you've realized that, you can either bury your head in the sand and run away, or you can actually take action. And it's so important to really make sure to talk about this and to raise awareness, not just within the music community, but to, to also include the audience in this journey, because this is basically the role, in my opinion, of the music industry, to inspire people, to tell stories, to bring people along with us. So. To me, it's really about the combination of enthusiasm and empowerment. And we need to shift the dialogue in this regard regarding sustainability. Just imagine if people get as excited, you know, talking about how to um, recycle or reduce their carbon footprint as they are about going to their favorite band's concert. You know, and if we can combine these two, I think we're on a really good way. But do we still have time, uh, Chiara? I mean, you said 15 years ago you, you realized with Julie's bicycle that we are running out of time, and I, people are talking about small steps. You know, do small things like uh, don't use when you go to hotel rooms and at a festival, don't use uh, the, the dispensable um, soaps and stuff like that. But that isn't going far enough yet. Are we going to end up having enough time in the end? What do you think? I think we always have the time that we have. Um, climate change happens in fractions of degrees. It doesn't happen um, along these sort of cliff edges. So absolutely everything that we do matters. Um, and 
as long as we mobilize from the small things into the really big things, um, then we're on the right way. And I think coming to that idea of, you know, how do we support and bring artists into it? I think that's why it's so important that as businesses, we create that supportive scaffolding because to some extent, the art and the voice will also take care of itself if we can build that structure and that ecosystem that really allows it to shine and that sort of speaks from that place of value where we're not just talking, um, but actually really demonstrating uh, the future that we want to build. And uh, then we come to the Impala's uh, sustainability program, Horst. Um, I'll, I'll read a couple of the, the points on it because uh, otherwise people won't, might not have an idea of w what's in it. Um, it's The goal is for the European independent music sector um, to to go in, in the right direction uh, concerning climate uh, change. And the number one is hold framework for European independent music sector targets. Con set number two, convene and administer a sustainability task force. Has that happened yet? Yes, we have. Yes, ob yeah. obviously. Um, appoint a climate advocate for Impala's board in each committee. That has yes. also happened. Yeah. Uh, develop carbon reporting tool for members. Uh, disclose aggregate statistics. Uh, yes, <laughs> we are in production. We, we, I think we just gave the job to produce it. We finally have the funding together. And now it goes into production, so we will have a custom-made meter for the music industry where we can see where are our hotspots, mm -hmm. and that's the start of a reduction. Transparently monitor and report on climate, climate impacts? Yes. <laughs> Map and share examples of best practices across Europe? I think we're working on that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Make climate literacy training available twice a year? Um, they're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Produce guidance from members with practical tips. Yes, that's there. So give us some practical tips. Let's, let's stop there for a second. What are the, some of the practical tips that you're giving out to people and what are the, how are they, they being involved? Because as, as Impala, you really are a, 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 a company that, that asks the board members and the people who are part of it to also have an opinion and, and give input, right? Yeah, so what we, of course, suggesting first is uh, switch to green energy, speak to your providers, how that, what is their plan uh, to green their organization, which where they are already, um, give training to your employees. Um, there are, I mean, we, I can also say that, for instance, VOT has their own plan on their website where they give recommendations to people. France has their own plan where they give recommendations to people. I think it's more for us to be a sounding board of what's possible and then it's translated on national level. And, but it's the actual trips. I mean, I can say from ourselves, we have now in our company an overstock reduction program where we have surprise packages when you buy something from K7 and Bandcamp. You have the opportunity to buy for three euros a vinyl. And when you order a DJ Kicks, you get a, a surprise DJ Kicks, which actually is an overstock which otherwise would have gotten destroyed. We implemented switches to all our desks. So when people leave, they are requested to switch off all the electricities. Um, Etc. PP. I think it's it's quite endless and um, the opportunities. If I, I look in other sectors, not only the cultural sector, um, a lot of the industry makers are saying it's the policy makers, the politicians, who are standing in the way of some changes. What would you say? Would you agree with that, uh, Katrin? Well, I think that um, the policy and laws and regulations are not going far enough. So I think we need to be heading the change and spearheading the change because the music industry, even in the past, has always been this inspiring pioneers of change. If you think of Bob Dylan or, you know, just during specific times, people were expressing that in songs and this is our creative power. So I think we need to get ahead of actual laws coming into force. I think it's also about changing the perception um, but what we're hearing a lot, yes, it's important, but mm -hmm. we have different priorities. It's actually pretty simple. You just have to start with it. And it's, it's nothing which happens overnight. It's, nothing, it's something which happens over years. And, um, and, and once you start with it, it starts to become a culture of your company. And that's important that it's part of every department of the companies and people feel and breathe it and execute it. And that's also what we have seen in K7. So once we started our program, the, the employees, our team engaged with it and they coming with suggestions to the table. So it's now a living culture. And I think we're all sensitive to nature. And I think 
especially you know in the last years we all made a lot of money on fossil oil burning and energy burning that we owe that to give that back and i can only say there's a great sensitivity there to embrace it and we have to give examples i mean for my company i'm now at the point that we have our assessment ready we have executed our reduction plan and we're probably going to announce net zero soon and we're doing that because we want to show hey it's not that difficult if you spend a little bit time on it to understand the processes there comes impala into place to give guidance it's not that difficult and there are very easy wins and 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 it feels good and honestly it's also important i mean from a standpoint from k7 being in berlin our competition is sony universal soundcloud spotify apple these are the companies we're recruiting against and a lot of startup stuffed with venture capital who don't have to make profit so yes it's a culture yes i'm as the owner of k7 yes we owe it to the society and he come afterwards that we fix it but also we need it as an employer value and we see that now people coming to us and saying yes there are companies who are paying more but money is not everything and that that is what we feel and there we we win and i think that's also what chiara means you create a value in the society and that value has more than is than just monetary making money and i think that's all what we learned money is important but money is not the the, the most important thing in in the cultural sector absolutely not uh, Kiara, yeah. <laughs> I, i agree completely um uh, Kiara, but before i hand off to, to nicholas to answer the question of, about politics and the, the role and, and the responsibility and standing in the way of the changes because it's not going fast enough what is your input on it being in great britain um and, and is brexit a, a become a problem to uh, implement changes I mean, I think what, what policy does is it sets directions and it sets priorities. Um, I think, you know, we, in some ways, values are hugely important, um, but those can also be influenced by the sort of policy frameworks and structures that are out there. Um, if uh, cultural funding enables, say, the, the building of new concert halls that we may or may not need, but doesn't enable the retrofit for uh, climate neutrality of existing buildings, then that is a signal that is very difficult for people who are working in that sector to ignore or move against. So I think there is, and that's the role of policy, which is where are the incentives going, what's being financially subsidized, and what is not being financially subsidized, and how can we shift those things so that actually we make it really possible for the businesses who do want to take a lead um, and who do want to take action to do the right thing. And of course, um, you know, my, a lot of my job is, is working with people to step forward and take on that leadership role, even when maybe the policy isn't there. But ultimately, what we really want to see is, is changes in, um, in the overall framework. Um, I, I think with Brexit, what it has been uh, within the UK is, um, uh, should we say, a huge distraction or, or an energy suck in terms of all the things that need to be negotiated and renegotiated at a time when that energy really needs to go into looking at our climate and environmental policy. So, Nicholas, what do you have to say <laughs> as, as the policymaker, as the politician, uh, to the points of, of uh, politics standing in the way? Obviously, the Greens are, are the ones who are trying to push it forward, but, but um, what can you do to convince uh, other parties? Well, first of all, I mean... Um, once, one thing that came to my mind now several times actually is the one about that, uh, about the tree. You know, the, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time to plant a tree is right now. And it's pretty much the same thing with the climate change. Of course, it's actually way too late to uh, climate prove our society, but better now than ever. It's not a reason to not do it anyway, because we're just, you know, it's getting worse and worse and worse, and so therefore we need to start with it um, as soon as possible and do as much as we can. And that uh, is also um, true for the politics that we do. Normally you would say, you know, politics has stood in the way too much, definitely, but it's uh, never too late to change it uh, right now, and so I think that's something that we need to do. What we see in the, in the um, culture, Uh, policy, you know, that is very interesting, I think, is that in theory, the most uh, are supportive of the cultural sector. And as you know, in the, um, you know, also the European Parliament is a little bit different than what we have uh, in national parliaments because we don't have this government coalition versus 
uh, opposition uh, talk, but we really work, have the freedom to work together if we want that. And I, in the cultural sector, I'm really happy that we're actually doing that quite a lot in the European Parliament. We're having a great uh, group, of, uh, which is called the Cultural Creators Friendship Group, that we uh, organize, and where we have members of six different groups where really, uh, you know, um, right uh, conservatives work together with uh, left wing um, um, socialists because they all focus on this question how can we bring um, uh, culture forward and also the question of uh, sustainability in culture is what something that is uh, of major interest to uh, to all groups in this well but what surprises me then is even though there is support from six different political groups uh, we have more of a problem to convince the rest of the party to see it as a priority that is the thing culture is always seen as an add-on and sustainability also um, we used to be more of an add-on, something like, you know, all oh, the nice, uh, the, the um, climate protectionists, they, they can do their hippie stuff and do whatever they want. Oh, we don't really care about this because it's not important. And it seems to be a certain way the same thing, uh, how uh, other parties seem to value culture as well. It's always about the economy, 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 but it's not so much about the question of how do we want to live together. And if, you, if we put that in value, that's something that I think uh, has been mentioned also, uh, that we don't look primarily only to money, but really what does good living mean, and that it's including sustainability, that it's including uh, cultural diversity, and the, the freedom to express yourself, and the possibility to enjoy uh, music and culture, um, then we would have probably quite a different society. So in order to achieve that, though, uh, we need to convince, really convince um, our own members, you know, and, and I would say in the green group it's easier than in others, to be honest, because we're more, you know, free thinkers in a certain way, but also there we need to convince them, to be honest, and we're doing that in this uh, uh, all uh, again. Um, but in other groups, I think we need to show them that the need for sustainability and the need for cultural earth is, is, is there. And we did that uh, during the 2019 election for the European um, Parliament, when Greens, especially in Germany, won by, you know, 22%, uh, and uh, suddenly, and also all over Europe, I mean, we, had, we, had, we, we doubled our numbers all over Europe, um, and suddenly the Commission said, oh God, there are a lot of people going on the streets asking for, for climate change protection, uh, asking for sustainability, uh, and they introduced the Green Deal. It is not perfect, but it, it, it especially brought the other groups, the Social Democrats, the Christian Christian Democrats and the Liberals towards the idea, okay, we need to do something because otherwise we will lose the next election as well. And if we can do the same for sustainability as a whole and not just climate protection, and if we can do the same for um, for, for climate, uh, uh, sorry, for, for culture and music, uh, then I think we can convince the other parties to take seriously what they're doing in the, um, in the culture committee, for example. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens uh, on the election on Sunday, see in which direction the, uh, the Germans uh, decide to go. Um, you just said, or Nicholas just said, that climate change and culture is an add-on. In my perspective, I think COVID at the beginning was it showed, proved exactly that. Right now, I have a feeling it, we're going, it's a, re, a new start, a restart. Katrin, you opened an agency now. Um, it, was that because of COVID or was that what a result of COVID and what was happening in, in the climate change se sector and or what was happening in the climate change area? Yeah, it, it actually is a direct result of COVID because I'm actually a booking agent and tour manager by training and still work uh, as the, in that profession. And then all of a sudden I couldn't work for one and a half years. So I have not been working full time for one and a half years, being on furlough or the office being shut down completely. So, you know, I just thought about and so when I joined Music Declares Emergency, it was really, to me, it was a very empowering feeling because I could finally do something and rededicate my time to something meaningful. And I think that we just, there's no getting around this, you know, and I th actually think, I don't want to say that COVID is a good thing, it's obviously not a good thing, but it has given the music sector the time to take a step back and really think about what we're doing as a, as a whole and look at processes and maybe rethink certain ways because we needed that break to really start something new and start in a different way. Maybe you can give a little bit of an insight on, what, on the agency and what it does. 
what, how, or how you work? Yeah, so uh, we're basically focusing on uh, greenifying tours, you know, because um, so my partner is from the communications and PR side and I bring the production and tour management and booking expertise and we combined that with our training and sustainability because the past year we've done a bunch of uh, trainings and workshops and sessions to educate ourselves and to, com to combine that and really help others in the transition towards also implementing these um, ideas into their everyday business life. And, and, and being a role mo model doing that, um, and as well as I, I hear, obviously we were talking about the European market. Haas, do you think we as the Europeans can be a role model um, on, a, on a global market? Um, or do you think that uh, globally that might put us in a, in a difficult situation at, a, at one point? I, I, th I think we can <coughs> definitely be the role model. I mean, when we speak to our colleagues at A2IM in America, uh, the independent indie organization, they just get started. They're just getting together their committees. They're just trying to understand what they want to achieve. And we can say in Europe, we are really much further than that. And it's a constant rolling and developing. It's a very undefined thing in a way because we're defining it every day new. But we have a lot of things to share. And I think that's great because we're speaking about one world and of course we will share with everybody who wants to share. I mean, even when we see the calculator we're creating, you know, because it doesn't exist at the moment to, to, to calculate manufacturing and shipping in any, in any meter. I mean, we're in talks with various people who are very interested and you can imagine who they are to, sh to share that meter because there's only one industry and we all do the same and it's important that we share and 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 there's a lot of things to share and Europe is ahead luckily and um, yes. Chiara well, what would you uh, say on that point on, on being a role, mo a role model for the global world? I think absolutely there's an opportunity to be a role model and I think there is also a historic responsibility uh, as one of the continents who's contributed uh, most to the climate crisis historically to step forward and help undo some of that damage. Um, and within that, you know, I think there are absolutely things that we can do within Europe um, and also worldwide priorities that we can support in different ways. Um, climate justice and environmental justice call as well. You know, we're lucky that we live for the most part on a continent where we have democracy and, and freedom of speech, and that's not the case across the world. There are some places in the world where it's incredibly dangerous to step forward and take action on climate. And I think um, in terms of taking really on, taking on that leadership, it's also one must ask, like, how can we support that global movement, especially in places where um, they, there is not the same privilege and also not the same historical responsibility as here? And uh, Nicholas, I'm going to ask you for a quick, a short response because we're running out of time. What would you say on, on a global view uh, from your perspective? Well, uh, certainly the... Sorry. I always have the echoes. I have to turn off my head on, you know. But on the global scale, I would say that Europe has a certain level of sustainability. However, uh, other um, uh, states are, especially the United States after Trump, have declared that they want to follow up and they have very big climate um, targets. They have a, a huge um, um, idea of where to go. China has just announced to close or to not re uh, build new um, coal plants, coal power plants throughout the world and so on. So there's a, a huge development and I think it is good that we have an advantage over that but we are pretty much and pretty soon losing this advantage if we're not continuing with it. And I think there's the benefit of having the advantage because uh, it, it brings us to a, several important positions and we must not not um, lose it and so therefore continue to have an uh, additional um, uh, um, climate protection uh, policy as well as sustainability pro policy, especially in different fields like culture. I think that is something that's quite unique throughout uh, um, the world, and especially in this broader uh, or this. Uh, um, yeah, in the size that we have here, even though it's not completely that um, but but uh, we, we need to continue to work on it and to continue to proceed because then we have a strategic advantage when it comes to uh, setting ideas, setting uh, innovations, etc. Nicholas, 
Nicholas, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Horst, thank you for your time today, Katrin and Chiara. And thank you, Reeperbahn Festival, for, for letting us discuss this very important topic. I just came from a discussion on a gender balance and um, that the Reeperbahn Festival allows us to talk about these things and makes it important, is such an important thing. I thank you all for listening today and uh, I wish you a wonderful festival. And at home as well, um, come join us in live next time. Otherwise, have a good day. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.